and also we have uh, um, somebody fly via video conference and that is from the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, Ms. Cara Faith, Director of the Fundamental Freedoms of Program. Freedoms Program, sorry. And I understand you have a presentation to make first. And we'll start with Ms. Swibel first. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, my, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Kara Zwiebel and I'm director of the Fundamental Freedoms Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, or CCLA. Uh, and I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to participate in discussing Bill C-304. The CCLA is a national nonprofit and nonpartisan public interest organization. Um, and next year, CCLA will celebrate 50 years of promoting respect for and observance of fundamental human rights and civil liberties. The fundamental importance of freedom of expression has been a cornerstone of CCLA's work since its inception. And at the same time, CCLA has also always promoted equality and fought, uh, for, fought against and campaigned against discrimination. While we understand that Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act was enacted in an attempt to combat discrimination, uh, and promote equality, we have been advocating for its repeal uh, and for the repeal of its provincial counterparts in some provinces uh, for many years, including by participating as interveners in many uh, court cases where the constitutionality of hate speech provisions have been raised. Um, we support the proposed repeal of Section 13 of the CHRA because we believe that a mature democracy does not achieve equality by limiting freedom of expression. And I'm going to focus uh, my opening statement on a few interconnected reasons why CCLA believes Section 13 should be repealed. First, uh, human rights tribunals are not an appropriate body to deal with the prosecution of hate speech. Uh, I know you heard from Professor Moon this morning and I, I, I uh, I can assume that he mentioned this issue as well as it was a fundamental part of his report. Uh, but the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal is charged with interpreting the act in a, in a broad and generous way. And it needs to do that to uh, combat systemic discrimination and to help achieve substantive equality. Because as we, as we know, um, more subtle forms of discrimination uh, and systemic forms of discrimination are more commonplace than the most obvious and blatant types. Uh, and so tribunal, the tribunal is charged with uh, interpreting its statute very broadly, but when it comes to the hate speech provision, uh, it's told to be very narrow in its interpretation. And the courts have said uh, that only the most extreme forms of hate speech are caught by Section 13. Um, this is the kind of uh, speech that compares minority groups to animals or pests that suggests that the group's elimination from society is the only answer to society's problems. Um, this is the very extreme end. And confining hate speech to this small subsection of offensive discourse is necessary because of the importance of protecting freedom of expression, but it's also completely counter to what human rights tribunals are used to doing. It places both the commission and the tribunal in the unenviable position of having to tell some groups that even though, uh, for example, statements written on a website about a particular group are extremely offensive and hurtful, they don't quite rise to the level of hate speech. Um, uh, for the purposes of the act. In addition, the narrow reading of section 13, while necessary from a freedom of expression perspective, um, ignores the fact that many more subtle forms of offensive messaging may actually have a more harmful impact on minority groups and on society as a whole than the blatant and extreme hate speech that section 13 actually catches. The second reason why we believe Section 13 should be repealed is because it's an ineffective and inefficient mechanism for addressing the problem of hate speech and discrimination in our modern society. The complaints and investigation process is lengthy, 
Uh, and even though the tribunal has confined findings that the section has been breached to only the most extreme types of speech, merely controversial forms of expression uh, may be the subject of a complaint and an investigation that will hang over the head of uh, the subject of the complaint for months, if not years. This can place a real chill on expression that is controversial, perhaps even offensive, but not hateful within the meaning of the act. And as a democratic society with a strong commitment to equality uh, and to multiculturalism, Canada has an obligation to try to address discriminatory treatment and practices, but it also has an obligation to choose mechanisms to do this that are efficient and effective. And uh, Section 13 has proven to be neither and should be repealed. Finally, uh, while there are lots of different views about what kind of harm or damage hate speech actually causes, CCLA believes that focusing on prosecuting complaints at the tribunal is the wrong way to go about trying to achieve equality and root out discrimination. Resources should be directed at education and at countering hateful messages. And those who preach hate in Canada, it's, it's worth noting, are a minority and we need to consider putting mechanisms in place that would help facilitate powerful counter speech. While we appreciate that Bill C-304 may not be where these changes will be made, we do believe there's a role for government in help empower ordinary Canadians to speak out when faced with hateful messages. Um, that's all I wanted to start off with as my opening statement, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Can I, can uh, I get, oh, oh, yes, you do, but can yeah. I get, uh, Ms. Well, I'm, I, I aired, I didn't come to you after the first question, so feel free to answer Senator Atula John's query as well, and also then to Senator Munson, and then we'll go back to Senator Munson. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just briefly, uh, with respect to the first um, questions, I don't, I don't believe that repealing Section 13 will have a very detrimental impact on minorities. I, I, as I said, I think that Section 13 has not been an efficient and effective uh, mechanism for dealing with the problem of hate speech. And if we just look at those on the paper uh, in the Canadian Human Rights Act, it looks like a powerful and important tool. But if we look at what's actually happened at the tribunal, uh, the vast majority of uh, hate speech cases that have been prosecuted by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal uh, or by the Commission at the Tribunal um, have been at the behest of a single complainant, um, an individual who, uh, who, used to be, uh, who used to work at the Commission and who had a personal mission to go out and deal with uh, hate speech on the Internet. Um, this is not a tool that is used by a lot of uh, uh, minority groups by a lot of uh, your average members of the community. Um, and whether that's because um, uh, the mechanism is unwieldy and costly and time consuming or whether it's because um, they prefer to address uh, actual acts of discrimination in a, you know, a swift and um, an effective manner is unclear, but this is not a, you know, Section 13 does not have this amazing effect that we might think. Um, it really hasn't been uh, a tool to eradicate hate speech, and many of the individuals, the kind of speech that is captured by this, many of the individuals who, um, who are ultimately found to have breached the code, uh, you know, that order doesn't mean much to them. Um, they're they're not shy to go out and continue doing what they're doing. And so, again, I don't think that um, that Section 13, that repealing it, will have this detrimental impact. Um, as far as the, whether it's costly or, or whether the burden is different under the, the criminal code, um, the difference with the criminal code, of course, is that it's the Crown that prosecutes uh, a hate speech um, complaint under the criminal code. And so the onus is not on a single individual to, uh, you know, to marshal all of the evidence. That onus is on the Crown. So that is a very, uh, a very different process. Now, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association does have concerns about the hate speech uh, provision of the criminal code as well. Um, but it certainly does have more safeguards and uh, appropriate due process built into it, um, given the fact that we are talking about restricting freedom of expression. Right. 
Good. So he answered. Thank you very much. No, I think Ms. Sibyl wanted to say something. Ms. Sibyl, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to, to clarify when I when I mentioned that uh, you know it's the subtle forms of speech that are often more dangerous. I wasn't suggesting that those are the kinds that would be caught by the Canadian Human Rights Act. Uh, section the, the definition of hatred under Section 13 and the definition that would be used in the Criminal Code uh, are not substantively different. It's it's the same type of extreme stuff that we're talking about. Uh, so I, you know I don't want to suggest that there's um, that the Human Rights Act is, a, is effective in addressing uh, the subtle types of uh, the subtle speech that can lead to discrimination, nor do I suggest that it should, uh, because that would place an extremely significant uh, infringement on freedom of expression. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we do need to start thinking uh, outside the box, so to speak, to consider how we can address discrimination um, outside of these mechanisms. I guess I'd say that uh, we have to look at, you know, one of the things that the courts have talked about uh, and one of the reasons that there are no defenses uh, under the Canadian Human Rights Act to Section 13 is because what, what the provision is aimed at is the impact, the impact of hate speech on society and on minority groups. And, um, you know, while I can appreciate we might be concerned about attracting um, you know, uh, fringe individuals to the country, um, the existence of the site, whether it's based in Canada or based elsewhere, the impact is the same. Um, and, and, you know, so I think we do need to think about the, the impact that, um, that this has and whether Section 13's existence actually makes any difference uh, to that. Um, I also just want to say that I, I think... Um, you know, the question was asked earlier, are we removing uh, protection for minority groups? And I, I think we do need to, um, we really do need to think about the ability of ordinary individuals to deal with this kind of expression. Uh, you know, recently there was a, ca a campaign on, uh, on the social networking site Facebook. Uh, a bunch of individuals found that um, some very nasty uh, things were being directed against women, uh, some very nasty comments. And, uh, you know, they brought the issue to the attention of advertisers, um, and Facebook has changed its policy. Um, this is an example where individuals are empowered. This, this hate speech that we're talking about is not what most Canadians believe, and that's where I think the tolerance of our society is an important thing to consider. This is not what most Canadians believe, and we need to give individuals a way to address and counter this speech. Uh, and Section 13 has not, has not been that way. Um, and so I, I don't think we're doing harm to minority groups by, uh, by repealing it. I think we, we do need to think of other ways uh, to address it. Um, I have a question of Ms. Sibyl. You know, a number of times this morning when you've been making your presentation, you have said there, there are other methods, and there, there are other methods, and, uh, you know, multiple times I've said there are better, better ways to address hate speech, such as education, than the Human Rights Act. Um, are these two mutually exclusive, and what, what other methods would you suggest? So I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, you know, I, I mentioned counter speech, and that's because uh, there's a, a number of examples. You know, the United States has a, a, a very robust protection for freedom of expression, and that uh, includes expression that uh, in Canada might be uh, very well considered hate speech, um, you know, considered over the line. Um, and they've as you know I think maybe as a result of uh, the absence of laws that that prohibit those uh, kinds of expressions um, they've uh, individuals have often developed creative ways to address counters to address hateful speech so uh, some of you may have heard of um, a pastor um, the, the Westboro Baptist Church uh, in the United States, uh, and a pastor at that church who um, engages in some very disturbing and distressing behavior um, uh, in anti-homosexual uh, statements and comments. 
he actually is the individual who, who goes to military funerals and protests. Um, so this is not only an offensive message, but an extremely uh, you know, offensive place to express those views. Um, and, uh, and what's happened in the United States is, is that some individuals have formed a network that uh, attempts to shield the family from these individuals. So they actually create a, you know, a circle around the family to try and uh, prevent them from being faced with these terrible messages um, and, uh, and to show their support. Uh, another example actually involving the same church uh, is that uh, a, an organization purchased the property right across the street from the church, um, painted it in rainbow colors, and has started a, a fund to uh, help with anti-bullying programs. So they've, they've confronted the message. They've tried, uh, they haven't tried to censor it, they've tried to confront it and counter it. And you know, one of the harmful effects, in my view, of provisions like Section 13 is that it can have the effect of actually amplifying the kind of speech that it's trying to silence. Uh, if you look at Mr. Whatcott in, in the Saskatchewan case, uh, he, he distributed flyers to some homes in Saskatchewan. Um, without a complaint process, without being taken to the tribunal in Saskatchewan, uh, those individuals who's rece who received those flyers probably would have been the only people who heard his message. But because of the prosecution, he had a national forum. He was at the Supreme Court of Canada. And indeed, the messages that are considered hateful are actually appended to the Supreme Court judgment. So now everyone has an opportunity to hear from Mr. Whitecott. And I have to say that I don't believe that the decision of the Supreme Court has deterred him in any way. Uh, I don't think it's had an impact in terms of his desire to spread the message. In fact, uh, you know, now he is online. Um, he's using Twitter and other things to, to get to people who, who want to hear what he has to say. Um, so I think these, these, a provision like Section 13 can have a perverse impact. And even though I don't think, you know, education and other programs are, um, are mutually exclusive from uh, Section 13, uh, as I've said, I, I just don't believe it's been an effective or efficient mechanism for dealing uh, with this problem, and I do believe it's had a chilling impact on freedom of expression, because the definition of hatred is inherently subjective. Um, and if you look at tribunals and courts, in the Whatcott case, uh, you know, the tribunal found that they were all hateful messages. The Saskatchewan Court of Appeal disagreed. The Supreme Court said two messages were, two messages weren't. So we have, you know, learned tribunal members and judges looking at the same speech, applying the same test, and coming to different results. Um, and that is not a clear standard. And when it comes to restrictions on freedom of expression, we should insist on clearer standards. Okay, so we will now adjourn till 2.30. Uh, Thank you.